because of how it brings in business and what locates around that because of uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Air Force Base, for example. But, but once again, there are many cities where it's not one industry, but then it's a clustering of a cluster of industries. For example, here's another example. Um, Boston, it would be technology, higher education, medicine, science. Uh, think about all that traditionally as well. Uh, in New York, it's so many different businesses. It's just, it's, it's, it's everything. Of course, in Washington, D.C., it is government. Absolutely. No, and it generates the multiplier there is phenomenal. What would you say it would be for Los Angeles? Movies. Yeah. Movies. Hollywood. Entertainment. Yeah. That's right. It's worldwide what it does there. It's amazing, right? Uh, so, so you can see how that is. And, so, and then you look in even smaller scale in your communities, what is it that gives you that particular advantage? So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going into all these other things. Look at your transportation infrastructure. Of course. So Noah was supposedly stuck on the highway this morning. No, no, right. surprise. No, all right, all right. So, but, but the sunrise. highway moves fine. Yeah. Oh, really? Now, sunrise is a disaster. Okay. But still, that's part of our transportation infrastructure, and I know we're all going to solve that with our automatic self-driving. Uh, Uber-oriented vehicles, where we'll just have it called up on our apps, it'll pick us up, it'll get us where we need to be, and because it's self-driving, because it's all controlled by a master satellite in the sky, that way our capacity right now, we realize that, first of all, 90% of roadway capacity is unutilized. But when we have these automated vehicles, everything's going to be spaced together so neatly and tightly, we won't need to build extra roads, we won't have to build all that other stuff, and as soon as that first accident happens, and everything goes cram, well, but it's still safer than letting humans do it, right? I don't know about that, I'm just being provocative. Uh, yes, question. The effect on the, we were talking about older people. Um, wherever they so, may be. Right, wherever they are. I don't know where they are, okay. but I'm one of them. The, but go the ahead. fact that there's going to be automated cars, mm -hmm. Do you think that that will have a huge impact on the development of buildings for, for, not assisted living, but for its own niche where they don't need to park? Because I, I think there are, if and when we get that technology in place, and there are huge hurdles, there are substantial benefits both ways. Just think about this. There are people who say, oh my goodness, guess what? So older individuals who might be uh, uh, to don't have uh, mobility now, you'll have mobility, number one. And so, and if you have the ability and money to pay for it, number one. Uh, people who say, oh, guess what? You want walkable lifestyles? Guess what? If you have that nowadays, you might actually continue to see further exodus out it may actually encourage greater sprawl because if you don't have to pay attention while you're driving, people already are not paying attention while they're driving, then you can work, do whatever it is while you are commuting. I mean, so there are all sorts of benefits and costs. I just think that um, it, it, they're just phenomenal changes. Just think, look at the huge parking garages that are being built. Yeah, all you have to do is look at the uh, you know 826 and 836 and look at all the garages and everything. Wait, do we need that infrastructure and the garages and the highways and the lane miles that are being constructed? At some point in the future, maybe not. And what do you do with that infrastructure? Do we build it? Right now, we are compelled and forced by zoning to provide it. So what happens when we don't need it anymore? What happens when you have the ride share, when the vehicle that picks me up and figures out how to get into my gated community, I haven't figured out how they do that well, yet. Well, RFID. Yeah, well, they, that's right. They'll have to, well, but there'll have to be some, you know, they'll have to have that code, and we'll have to make sure the security's right and everything. But once they pick me up, take me to my work, and then it goes to the next place, wait a second. Uh, so then my garage now becomes a true Florida basement, right? You don't need to be a coal, and all of a sudden it changes the form of our communities. I mean, in the next 50 years, if we don't have legal zoning, NIMBYism, bananaism, and all those other, did anybody look up what banana stands for? You forgot about that, didn't you? So there could be... Not yet, okay. But if we don't have all those other 
impediments, structural and otherwise, we're going to have a huge transformation. But it takes time to get there. I mean, look, I, I, I'm amazed every time I get on the Florida Turnpike or I-95 and saying, oh my goodness, I'm like everybody else stuck in this infrastructure. And you see the enormous opportunity for change, but I don't know when it's going to happen. And so we've got to figure out, but we know it's going to have an impact. And then, how do we create the incentives to stimulate that change? And if you look at all these different cities, where is that happening? So if you take all these items that I just put together, where is the absolute growth happening? These are the top cities, right? I'll send you a chart which shows where the growth is. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll look at it. But so when you look at growth, and maybe you all aren't going to end up staying in South Florida, or maybe you are, or wherever it is that you go, and you say, wait, absolute growth is important. Rate of change is important too, by the way. So, you know, by the way, everybody says, there's no growth in New York. Okay. There are 20 million people in New York. So if the growth rate is less than 1%, we're still adding what? How many people? Right? Right. We're adding still at one, even 1% 1 of 20 million people. It's 200,000 people. But let's see if Austin, which has a population of 2 million people, has a growth rate of 10%. That's the same 200,000 people. So where do you want to be? It depends. Like well, but it depends. That's the point. Like it depends on what your opportunity, what your, your focus is. So there's opportunity in all those areas, right? And so then the key is, you know, look at where those features are that make it interesting for each of those areas. And then, yes, then when you look at it, it's top 10 population. Okay. And what are the features for those areas? They're in certain states, Texas, gateway cities. We're in a gateway city, right? We're in a port city, right? So you're a developer. What are you looking for again? So, you know, we keep looking at all these things. All right, so I'm, I, you'll get this uploaded to Blackboard. You'll get all those features. All right, so let's now talk about the deal. So you take all these items into your deal, right? And I'm going to focus again on the factors that make this work. So we're going to start at the top. You're not going to be like every developer that says, I love what I'm going to do, here's my design, now I'm going to figure out how I'm going to do it. You're going to take the garbage in, garbage out, and you're going to make sure it's information in that makes sense, and you're going to do the market study, and that's all part of doing it smart. So you're going to do the larger market analysis, which is what we're going to help you figure out with some analysis here, that's the major study. But you're going to do then ultimately specific site studies. So you looked at an article today, but you don't know what site that applies to. Ultimately, you're going to figure out, hey, I've got a site right here. And what did I just do when my study on that site up in Palm Beach, uh, in North Palm Beach? We studied the site. We didn't win the bid, like I told you. Um, actually, no, did I tell you about that? No. Uh, yes, yeah, so here's what happened. So we did the first round, this is two, two and a half weeks ago. We put in our bid, we made it to the second round, and we found, just found out this past Wednesday, we were outbid by more than three quarters of a million dollars on the, the best and final. And we were told, I mean, I know we bid the right number, but we have competition from another half dozen who still bid more than we did. But they've not performed their due diligence. We did not only the marketability study, we did the financial analysis as well. And we figured it out. And we're not going to fall in love with the deal. We did all three steps even before we got the letter of intent signed. Because, you know, we're putting in eight figures of our money to do the deal. And so the challenge here is I'm going to take you, you're not going to get the financial analysis here. You're going to get to figure out the marketability here. And that's what I'm going to take you through these steps. What? How much do you, just curious, how much did you guys spend in just that part, just to put the bid? You know, prior to. A lot of our time. But money wise. If I told you, I'd have to kill you. Mm -hmm. okay. So the point is, on each deal, it's different. On some deals, you can spend tens of thousands. 
we're very smart and efficient. And frankly, in this deal, all we did is we hired some very smart lawyers and we had a good deal with them to figure out some key critical zoning issues. Um, but uh, so what we did, we have our own internal um, financial expertise. Um, we didn't do the design, but we have our own internal architectural and planning expertise. Uh, we have our own retail and residential expertise. So because we have that in-house, we didn't have to spend that kind of money. But I've done that. In fact, on some deals, I've spent up to a million dollars. Just to bid? No, that was after I owned the property. And, uh, but, so it can take a lot of time and effort. So we spent four weeks, three and a half, four weeks, and we didn't spend much money. But you can spend a lot. And that's the issue here is how to do it smart. And if you have the resources, sometimes you spend it. But for the attorneys, we spend a little bit of money to do it right. So, so the key here really is making sure that you get from the market. And you started doing that with just a simple analysis. You said, oh, here are the interesting pieces of information. I'm going to get you through to this. And then hopefully you'll get that with Dr. Forgey. And the key there is to go through the site, the economic and demographics, and evaluating the supply and demand. And that's why I keep telling you about supply and demand. Everybody keeps saying, wait, are you teaching development? Or are you teaching markets? I'm teaching you the markets to get you to figure out how to get true to development. And so we get through these major components of the market analysis, and I'm going to get you to, and I'm not going to read the words for you because I want to get to what I call the equilibrium analysis. But so. Our key is making sure we get the widest market acceptance for any product that you build, right? If you narrow slice, if you thin slice, then you're putting yourself at risk. You know that. Because you want to make sure that your target demographic always is going to be there in the most viable price point. You also want to do something which I call, you want to make sure that your absorption pace is great. Do you understand these terminology? I want to make sure that if you have any questions about my language, there's no concern here. So, uh, uh, so, so when you have something that you want to lease or sell, you want to make sure that it's done as quickly as you can. And that's called the absorption in the marketplace. So for example, one thing that we did, we figured out if I was going to build 120 units of housing on this property in Lake Park, how long would it take to lease up or absorb that in the marketplace. And so conservatively you could say, oh gee, well how many units a month would someone lease out those units? On that marketplace, let's make this up, would it take 10 units a month? That would mean, oh my goodness, a year, right? You know, 10 units into 120. Well, gee, could I do 12, wait, maybe I could do 20 units a month? And it's a six month absorption. That's a half year. And so your money isn't burning a hole in your pocket for a full year, it's for a half year. How okay. do you figure that, that, that out, the, the absorption rate? How do you... I'm going to show you how to figure that out. Okay. That, that's what I'm leading here. I'm trying to give you a sense of the in, in, individual points here for the analysis. So you will determine this because if you as a developer can do this on paper, where you don't spend the money, you just are smart, then you can get to the right point. Yes. Absorption on the absorption. I just have one question. Sometimes it is also expressed as a percentage. Which which way do you prefer? Whichever way works for you. Okay. So I mean, it, you're right. You can use it as a percentage of the marketplace. You can use it as a capture rate. You can use it as any number of ways. So we're going to see how that works. So you're going to look at mm -hmm. as a rate of change in, in rent or sale prices. You can look at how fast is the market. You look at it as analyzing how many units are out there in what I call a development pipeline in the marketplace. When we get to this tool, if I can just get that tool up for you, uh, we'll look at how much is out there. So how do I figure out my absorption in the marketplace? I look at how many units are in the marketplace that are competitive. I look at other factors that influence supply, such as, oh, by the way, is it comparable? Do I think that the unit next door looks like the unit that will be the one that I want to build? Am I in the path of growth or development? Do I have any major competition? Is anything else actually being built? 
that looks like our product, and I keep looking at more product issues, and all of these items get me to this issue of equilibrium and market share and capture rate. And it gives me the point where I'm actually going to do what I call an equilibrium analysis. An equilibrium analysis relates to demand and supply. If you can figure out who's demanding and who's supplying, you'll know where you are in that circle. You know whether you should build, develop, buy, or sell. And when does equilibrium occur? When the market's in balance. The markets are rarely in balance. Okay? But you can figure out if it's in balance. And so we can establish that level or rate of when the market is in balance. And we'll know it when the market starts to see rents rising. So if rents are flat and stable, we're in equilibrium. It may not be what we like. So for example, in a city where the rents stay the same all the time, then the rents are effectively saying that we're in equilibrium. If rents are going down, we're not. If rents are going up, we're not. But if rents are going up, it's an opportunity, and usually new construction commences because a developer sees that there's an opportunity to build, right? And if the market sees that, then that means it's real, okay, and what do we do? And by the way, it depends, and I'm going to show you the formula, it can vary widely. And so, it depends when is occupancy either 85 or 95 percent, or vacancy, if you will, is 5 to 15 percent. So when, you, so, you, so when you're in equilibrium, then new construction commences? So, when you're in equilibrium... No. So right... So just when rents start to rise... But the period before that was in equilibrium. Yes. And so, the smart developer says, can I get ahead of that? And so that's when you have to look at the trend and figure out, can you anticipate what that is? Because often, once it's happened, it's too late. It's too late. Too late. But you'll learn. That's when love comes into a game, right? Yeah. It's just, but okay, all right. Look, I'm 30 some years in the business and I don't always get that, though we get it. And so, so what happened in, in Lake Park is that the market is, it's in equilibrium. We know there's an opportunity, but others now have bid on that property. We know the right price. They think they can get in, but they're paying three quarters of a million dollars too high a price. We figured the cap rate, oh, let's talk about the cap rate, on that deal properly should be about just below 6%, but they're bidding the price of that deal down to about 5 or 5.5%. Five no, that doesn't make sense to us. Maybe they'll make it work. I hope they do. But I'm guessing that what happens is whoever they get to sign the letter of intent is going to come back and retrade the deal. Have you heard that term? You know what I mean by retrading? Renegotiate? Yeah. And they'll say, oh, I can't do this. In fact, we sent out our letter of intent, and we actually said, you know what? We figured out it's going to cost upwards of a million dollars to put a new traffic light at the intersection and do A, B, C, D, E. We're not going to retrade you. We're going to pay you the price that we know it's worth. And if you sign the deal with us, we'll do it right here. They said, thank you, you're probably right, but we're still going to go with the higher price anyways. We're going to take a flyer. And the reason why is because some of the other offers actually said they would put a non-refundable deposit down to as well. God bless. I wouldn't do that. I'm not going to risk my money on that. Not that big for you. Okay, so how do we figure this out? Here's our formula, and I'm going to hand out a piece of paper. So how do you to figure out, this is for office, I'm going to give you for office and for residential space, all right? Our objective is to determine, you know, we want to look at this equilibrium, you want to see, well, how many years of supply are out there? And if there's no supply, you know, there's an opportunity to build, right? So you look at the vacant space in the existing buildings, you add it to the vacant space that's under construction, 
and you add that to the vacant space that's proposed. You look at the pipeline, right? And then you divide it by the total demand. So once again, supply divided by demand. The result is the length of time. So simple formula. So for example, if I had 100,000 square feet of space that was in my total vacant space, if you will, and if I had 100,000 square feet that was in demand, well, 100,000 divided by 100,000 is one, kind of like at equilibrium. I can like come at one. But so, for example, if I had 200,000 square feet, and I'm going to give you the numbers, a vacant space, and I had a demand for 100,000, and my annual demand was 100,000, then 200,000 divided by 100 means that I have a two-year supply. So we can figure out how to use this, and there are lots of different resources that are out there to use it. So let me show you a simple formula, and I'll, and I'll hand you out this sheet too. So, and I'll, I'll send you the spreadsheet. So here, the numbers are real small on the page, but they're much bigger on the screen. Just by way of example, okay? So, it's just a, it's a made-up example. So, what you do is you just basically take the existing space, and you say, oh, here's my total inventory. And I say, what's available? That's the here and now. What's under construction? What's planned? And I put that together. So this is the pipeline. That's the chart A. What's the difference between office inventory and available space? Oh, oh so this is the total. So if I got 50 million square feet, and then my vacancy is, this is what's vacant in the ah. existing space. Thank oh, you. got it. That's that 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 and, 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 and then, so, so I got 50 million So that's feet. rented, avail, uh, rented yeah, vacant, and, and then. Yeah, and so 10% of the CBD, the, com, the central business district, in this fake example, is available. And then someone's building another 10 million square feet, and then someone has, you know, put into the zoning commission, or rather to the planning, uh, the uh, building department, another 5 million. And so basically I got 15 million plan. So this is just the way, you just look at the data. You usually can find this data by going to the building department or the planning department. Now, if you have, if you, so, so if you know that you have 50 million and 50 million are planned, how do you read that? What, how do you know that is in equilibrium or not? Oh, wait, we're not there yet. Oh, okay. Sorry. This is just, here's all the space. That's the first chart, okay? Then you start doing math. And I'll, and I'll send you the spreadsheet where the math is, okay? And then you say, oh, now you have to get in the calculation. So, so let's just look at the central business district. And, and I, this is a complicated example, but I just gave you a lot of different things. So the central business district, current inventory is like 53% of this make believe MSA. All right, current inventory is 50, and so the Construction and plan is 15. Remember, they're building five, they're planning 10. So that means the total inventory is 65 million. Now we know you can go to Jones Lang, CBRE, or Cushman Wakefield. Vacancy rates are 8%. I mean, you can pick that up by whatever. What's the normal vacancy rate? And so the vacancy rate on that inventory should be about 5.2 million in any equilibrium year. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's the usual vacancy, right? Mm -hmm. But the current vacancy is five, and we add that new construction, which is 15, meaning, oh boy, so we're gonna have 20 million square feet in the market that's gonna be added. Are you with me so far? Right. Mm -hmm. But now, guess what? So 20 million's being added, right? But, oh, by the way, but in a normal market, 5.2 million of it would be vacant. So actually, I'm only worried about 14.8 million square feet. You understand why? Because some space is always vacant. 
So here, then the issue is, so how much of this space do I have to fill to reach vacancy? So in fact, I don't have to fill all 20 million square feet. I only have to fill 14.8 of that space. Mm -hmm. So in fact, I only have to fill about 74% of that space mm -hmm. to get back to vacancy. So don't be fooled by the fact, I mean, you know, if it's in a market space where, you know, your normal vacancy is 8 or 10%, okay, because markets always have vacancy in their markets. So, so for, for those 20 million uh, in total, only 5.2 are going to absorb? No. No, no. In fact, in this but market, to get, back, 14 .8 to get back to equilibrium, you better absorb 14.8 million. So, and, and when you look at that on the total marketplace, wow, that's a lot of space in a market that right now, just think about that, that has a total of 65 million square feet. So that's a different number. So you almost have to rent everything you build. Yeah, that's a big number. So, so the interesting so, so, but you don't have to rent 20, you only have to rent 75% of it, give or take. So, so, it's, so, so ignore this for the moment. We don't care about the rest of the region. So let's look at a different number. So let, let's do this one. This might be easier to look at because it's a much lower number. So in this little sub-market, it's much smaller. The current inventory is 200, I'm sorry, 2 million. And there's only 100,000 this plan, all right? But usually 10% of this market's empty. So. Basically, vacancy, basically new vacant inventory is 210,000, right? Because we're building 100, right? And 10%. But now, so we add that together, we have 250,000, and you add that once again. So we add it together. So new vacant inventory is 350,000, and when we subtract the 210, just like we did over there, we've got to fill 140,000 square feet. So actually, 40% here of this market, much less has to be filled than in the other one. I mean, you've got to fill 14.8 million out of 65, but here we only have to fill 140,000 out of 2 million. So you might say, you know what, if I had to build a building, I might want to go to this sub market. The number at the bottom, the inventory to be filled. Yeah, this was if, if you were looking at the entire region. Okay. So I just say don't don't look at that right now. Depends if you're doing an analysis of everything. So uh, what I'm saying here, and the reason why this is value, is that you probably don't care. And overall, I wouldn't care about the overall vacancy. But what is interesting to me is that if I look at the amount of space, all I care about right now is that 14.8 million square feet. Then I take one more number. How many people does it take to fill that space? Because I don't know how long it's going to take to fill that space, right? But we know from statistics at CoStar and Reese how many square feet are allocated for individual workers nowadays. And it varies. But let's just say, you know, it used to be there was about 200 square feet per office worker. Actually, the number is lower. But let's make it easy. This means that there have to be 74,000 new jobs in the marketplace to fill that space. Well, isn't that interesting? So if there are 74,000 jobs to fill that space, and this is the growth in the market, it's going to take three and a half years to fill that space. I want to wait three and a half years. Maybe not. That's right. Unless, and unless I know that I've got my permits in place and everything. So this is a formula that helps you determine. So by the way, in submarket E, or excuse me, submarket, whichever sub, I think we were looking at submarket E. Yeah, we were looking at submarket E. Gosh, less than half a year to fill that submarket. I might want to build in that submarket six months to get there. And maybe the competition isn't there. 
also maybe the demand isn't there too, but if I build a smaller building in that market, that's where I want to go. So all of a sudden, you're a smart developer, and you're looking at opportunities, and you see a site, and you might say, I want to be in a site in my sub-market off of Sunrise, you know. Even though the traffic's lousy, that's where my demand's going to be. And that's what makes this so interesting as a tool. I'm going to go through one more example here. So basically, uh, the yeah. time, to, time for equilibrium there is the time that it will take to go to a normal vacancy. Yes, right. And so, so if there's another, if there's something unusual that's going on in the market, then we've got to adjust. And how do we do it? You look at the percentage vacancy in the market. And so you have to make sure, gee, am I guessing right on what the equilibrium rate of vacancy is for that sub-market? But, but, wouldn't, but wouldn't the, uh, the, the vacancy rate change over time uh, yeah, in yes. the market that it could be 5% now, next year maybe 6%? It, it might, yes. So are you comparing right. to a historical? Yeah, yeah no. that's right. So, so you've got to look at historical numbers and you have to you have to weigh the number, and you do a couple of analyses. And if you're within a range, you're probably going to guess right. But now you've got a tool, at least that you're not just flying blind. Right. Now you don't do it. And so let me skip over this next chart so I can give you this example. So I'm, I want to just go through it. So now you've got the ability to match the potential, and you can evaluate, and you, have, you can go to your client, you can go to your investors and say, I have a level of confidence whether or not I can build. And so this is what I did with our capital, by the way, I'm gonna show you what I did on my apartments. And in fact, we just reviewed another site somewhere here. With, we had our, our, our capital conference call yesterday. Last an hour, we take them through our sites every week or every other week, and we go through the same analysis. Say, yep, this looks good. And you know, within a margin of error, and we figure out, yes, we can get to that point. And then we make a decision of whether we do a go or no go. I'm sorry, something else that you can say about that, for example, that number, 3.29 yeah. years to... Uh, right, well, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to that market in that market. Right, but because that would also mean that for three years and a little bit, you will be, there will be an oversupply of offices mm -hmm. to the market. It, it, it takes that time to get there. But now, if I have a site, if I own it, if I have the permits, if my time to get to market beats it, all of the sorts of issues here. If I'm ahead of that, I might be there. And see, we can do the same thing for apartments. So here's, here's the apartment analysis. Slightly different way to look at this. Okay. This is a model. What did you do that you think you mentioned? Oh, well, that's, that's all. That's, you know, just an example, fake information. Okay. So, I mean, but I'll give you a spreadsheet about how you can use the math to figure it out. Okay. And so apartments are a little bit different. But it's the same sort of thing. And the equilibrium here is more about time and capture rates. OK? And so here, so you want to, once again, estimate years and absorption. So here I just came up with an example. Uh, and this is actually a live example that I took from the project that I did with some of my friends at the Weizmann Group in New York. And it was about looking at inventory and say, how many units are there in the marketplace? So here it wasn't about square footage. It was about the number of housing units, or multifamily rental units, all right? And we know, for example, in this particular market, look at the top there, the year-end inventory in 2014 was 160,000, 95% stabilized, and so, once again, I look at that, so stabilized occupied stock, less the actual occupied stock, meant that how many units could I absorb in that marketplace, divided by the actual absorption, and it says, oh my goodness, well, in this marketplace, it's just a month or two of oversupply. When it says 0.16, basically, that's a month or two. I'm sorry to interrupt, but these, these numbers are, are different for the ones. Oh, well, they are? Yeah. Uh, well, you're right. So let's look at this chart then instead. OK. These numbers, are, I rounded them off, so they're easy to read. OK. All right, so let's look at this number here. So that was an order example. So let's say I have 150,000. I guess I rounded them to make it easier. 95% is stabilized, so let's say 142 is what your normal stabilized stock would be, and how many can be absorbed in a year divided by what your annualized absorption is. 
So here, what we're basically saying, years of oversupply, basically you're saying is four months. Okay? So, how many units are under construction? How many units are at, under stabilized and divided by annual absorption? So your same pipeline, so your years of supply in this particular case looks like one and a half years of supply. And how many are planned? So basically, it's existing, under construction, and planned. And in this particular example, we've got two and a half years of supply. Same idea as what's up there, but the numbers are round. Any confusion here? Just a different way of looking at it. And, and once again, I made up the numbers, if you will. And every, yeah. And stabilized means equilibrium. Stabilized means equilibrium. And so every market may be at a different equilibrium. But most markets for apartments have been around three, four, or five percent. And then, what I did is on the second page, I said, how can I figure out whether this makes meaning, anything meaningful uh, to you? And of course, I mean, that's the second part, but this is a different set of numbers. And so, if we were building, and I said, well, I want to take these same numbers here, can I make it meaningful to me? So if I know that in this marketplace, I've got two and a half years of absorption, can I do it? So, for rental apartments, usually we target income groups, as well as age groups and millennial groups, and we look at primary and secondary markets. And so, in this particular case, we looked at the total number of households that might be in our market area, and we divided it by the total number of actual demand. So, let's look at the example. Look at the primary household column, which is the first column right there. How many households in this made up market, actually it's a real market, there are 90,000 households and 14% of them rent. It meant that my total opportunity were 12,000 plus households. And what's the turnover in every year? In fact, in most communities, one quarter of the households change their residence. So it meant from my existing renters, there were 3,000 potential renters every year. And then, how about the growth rate of every market? You know, people moving into the market, annual growth rate about 1%, and how many of them earn more than 100,000? Just 152. So the total household demand was 3,300. That took the 3,150 and the 152. And so how many of them could I capture if I built a project of either 180, 240, or 300 units a year, depending on my capture rate? And so I like capture rates that are less than 10%. And the reason why this is important is so if my total household demand is 3,300, and then I look at the number of years of supply that are out there, and I say, well, on the first page, I'm saying, well, gee, in my marketplace, I've got how many years of supply? Can I take that same supply and absorb within that either 180, 240, or 300 units per year? And so I'm looking at absorbing those units, can I do it successfully? So the smaller project that I have, can I do that? Sure. So when I went to Lake Park, can I absorb 120 units of housing in a market that had approximately 6,000 units of supply and demand? Sure. I figured it out because there the equilibrium said that we could absorb that up within about six months. Just like that. But if I found that the market had thousand units that were vacant and basically said that I had two or three years supply, I'd be much more hesitant. And I'd find that I wouldn't be able to capture and my capture rate might be much higher. Or I'd find that the number of years of supply absorbing may be much greater. Now I know I'm not giving you the chance and we're at the end here. And we can go through this map. And so when we do your market study and take your example, we're going to see if the numbers make any sense. And if you find that you have a low capture rate, or you have a low years of supply, then that helps you with a go decision to do anything on a study. And now you're a smarter developer. The 5.45% the, the is... So it, this helps once, me to... So, so in this case, you say, well, how big a project should I build? Or how many units can I absorb? So I may still build 300 units, but I may say, Gee, if I build 300 units, maybe I can only capture 15 units per month. So it may be that it would take me two years to capture instead of one year. 
Okay, but, the, but, but what I'm not following is the 5.45% of what? How, how do we get to 5.45? Oh, of the total demand that we have there, about the 3,300 units. Can I capture, what percent of the total demand can I capture? And if my, if my capture rate is less than 10%, I'm a happy camper. So that person, oh, what, 80 divided by? Yeah, 3,300. Got it. Got it. So, once again, so I just put the numbers up. We'll go through the math in greater detail at a later time. But I wanted you to see that now. So all these issues about market cycles, about looking at demand, about looking at all the factors, now you have the, the beginning of the toolkit to make you a smarter developer. And we're three minutes before the hour. Do you have any questions? Yes. I have a question. Uh, the next assignment is the co-star analysis for next class. But we haven't had any. But we didn't get to co-star. So, so we're not so, that. So you're going to have the reading assignment. Uh, I'm going to give you a different analytical assignment, which will be from an article that I'm going to choose. Okay. That's right. And we'll delay the co-star and the market assessment till next week when gotcha. we can review that. So thank you, because I was going to point that out in the schedule as well. So next week, hopefully, we'll get that, and we'll see if we can get ourselves. And then next week, we'll have Dr. Forge uh, do our basic herb. So some of them understand the herb already. Yeah. So that's a good start. So one of the things, make sure you bring your financial calculators as well. Yes, thank you. Next week, make sure we got that. And the, the, the one that I would recommend would be the HP 10B2. Yes. 10B, HP? HP 10B2. It's the one that we use in the... That's we right, and, and if you don't have it physically, we'll give you it, and if you don't, we also yes. can also yeah. find the... Yeah, uh, if you can find it on oh, Amazon yeah, you can find it on your, your eBay, iPhone as well. Probably like anywhere yeah. between yeah. 15 to 30 bucks. Yeah, and, and I have a version of it on my iPhone. <laughs> but, but it's better to have the physical one. The one on the phone, you can pull your roll, though. You can see your tape, I think they call it. Yeah. Right? yeah. Which yeah. is useful. That's right. And, uh, that, that way you know you're actually pushing the right buttons. Excuse me, yeah. Professor, Professor Mark. Can, can you explain what, one more time how sure. you can get the five point? Yes, so, so here's the total demand, and then I took 180 into 3.35. What's the reason why you prefer that one? What's the best one? Okay. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. well, Texas Instrument? I have and one financial. The, the idea is it, to, so what you want to do is you don't want to build do more doesn't do all of the same functions. Can okay. Absorb. A little bit different right. in terms so of how it's structured. Unless you know it really, really, really well, yeah, which I don't. Do then and I would say stick with I this. You can use whatever you want, but but in terms of following me, you're probably going to want to use the 10B2. I mean, ask no. It goes fast. Maybe that's why I like to see capture rates. Okay. For example, I want at least 600 units, and between the physical and the. Well, you're going to need no, the, the physical one for the, for, the, for, the, for the test and for the class, but you can use the iPhone version if you want to while you're following along in class. But that would have to be a very unique situation. And then I compare it against what the supply is in the marketplace. So I compare supply and demand. So the idea is to have the units. Well, you want to compare, you want to make 